I'm Dr. Robert Jackson, Director of the Institute for Classical Education, and I'm here with Dr. Greg McBrayer of Ashland University. We're going to have a conversation this afternoon just to find out what's happening up in your neck of the woods. Thanks for having me. Dr. McBrayer, what constitutes a good, perhaps even an excellent core curriculum? Because as I understand it, that's your purview. At Ashland. Yeah, I'm the director of Ashland's core curriculum. And so what constitutes an excellent core curriculum? Well, in the first place, I think we should be uh, sort of aimed at a liberal education. So we should be trying above all to help our students to live free and independent lives when they graduate. And that means a number of things. It means that they should be able to sort of think for themselves. Um, they should be able to think for themselves mathematically. There's sort of quantitative, there's a certain amount of um, quantitative analysis that one has to do to be able to live well in the world. I mean, there's, one has to understand something of natural science. I think that's important. Uh, but then there are, just, there are other things that sort of help one to live free and to not be dependent upon others for one's opinions, for, one, for how one functions in the world. I guess the second thing I would say that makes a core curriculum excellent would be uh, a focus on questions, not so much answers. So what are some questions that have perennially occupied the minds of some of the greatest thinkers? And what does it mean to be an educated human being? So what are the humanities? What does it mean to be a human being? In social science and in the humanities, what is justice? Uh, we have a core religion requirement at Ashland University. So, what is religion? What ought, what might God be? How do how do human beings come together and organize and, and worship the divine? Um, so, in, in all the areas of a good core curriculum, I think should be guided by sort of questions and sort of the search for these uh, the search for answers to these questions as best as one can. Um, so, so, those are the sorts of things I think that constitute an excellent core. It's curriculum. It's interesting because we often think university is where we go to get answers. Uh, it sounds trite, but we actually there's a billboard uh, into town that says Ashland University is teaching us how to think, not what to think. And I think that that, that gets at the heart of what we're trying to do. We're, we're definitely not trying to provide students with an indoctrination. We're trying to provide them, a, a liberal education ought to provide students with the tools to be able to think for themselves. Sure. Yeah. And yet, content's king, as some have said. Well, right? I was about to say one more part about, a, uh, one more important part about a core education is, in my view, it would be a focus on great books. So the Socratic method, sort of how we're going to engage texts, but also what you're going to read, and you're going to read the great books. So right now, uh, I've been working on a, a sort of core within the core at Ashland University where we're going to have a, a focus on great books. And we're going to try and have, we have 10, 10 categories in our core curriculum, and I'm going to try and focus on uh, what, are, what, are the, what does a great book in humanities look like? What would a natural science course look like that focused on the great books? These are all things we're trying to develop. So yeah, content is key. And what, one other small bit, by the way, is um, I, I come from the History and Political Science Department, and one of the content areas we think is important also is citizenship. Um, mm. We think that students, uh, and the empirical evidence shows that undergraduates across the nation have a sort of impoverished understanding of the principles of America. Mm -hmm. And so we're trying to figure out a way to implement something more meaningful that all students would be required to do at Ashton in that regard too. So important. Intellectual, yeah. moral, civic. Virtue, Absolutely. Right? Yeah, that's fantastic. Yeah. Well, you have studied Xenophon. And yes. The other great Greek historian. Yeah. So I do want to give you a chance to, to step up on that on that bully pulpit, as it were. Tell us what makes the study of ancient history important or valuable sure. for us as moderns. Gosh, uh, so many things. So uh, what makes the study of the ancients valuable? N number one, so pedagogically, just like we were just talking about, one of the beauties of teaching ancient texts is that students don't typically have a lot of vested interest. They don't realize what's at stake. And so you can have these questions where you tackle these really impressive questions, like what, what is justice? What's the meaning of justice? How ought cities to behave toward one another? Um, we just had an ally turn on us, but we've recaptured them. How are we to deal with them? So you can, you can get them to address meaningful questions that are still very much alive in the world, mm -hmm. but it, they don't recognize immediately how much it bears on what they're doing. So th yeah. this kind of being able to do it dispassionately is very helpful. Right. I guess the second thing is, uh, you know, I, I chose Xenophon as my area of study because I, I happen to think he, he does it very well. I mean, he understands things, and I think that some of the things he understands about the world are peren perennially true. I mean, that human nature his insights into human nature are still valid. I mean, mm -hmm. his account of war, his account of uh, how leaders ought to be is really important. And I think it's just as valid today as then. He, he focuses on great men in his historical works. Mm -hmm. And I think that a lot of the trends in my, my understanding of the history, the study of history these days, doesn't focus as much on the, the noble deeds of great men. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what Xenophon's principally interested in. Yeah. Yeah, great men, great women, mm -hmm. right? Great leaders yeah, absolutely. In, our, in our history uh, really do provide inspiration for us. Absolutely, for sure. Inspiration is important because we are living in an age at times where there's a cynicism that seems to, to permeate. So yeah, tell absolutely. us, please, what are some of the hopeful signs that you see in higher education? What are some of the hopeful signs I see across the country in higher education? Well, one is just young people. Um, young people, 
what I love about young people is whatever, you know, we as adults and we as sort of older folks, we sort of look back and like, ah, oh, things are going sort of badly. Young people aren't there yet, they don't know. So they, they always come to college with a kind of optimism. They don't have that cynicism you just mentioned. And so if we can cultivate that and show them that there are things to aspire to do and there are sort of objects of admiration, if we can capture them, I think we can cultivate that and that's very good. So, so young people, um, what other trends in higher education do I find helpful? I, I think that um, some organizations I've done some work with, ACTA and some other organizations, they're seeing that one of the paths forward is to sort of lay out voluntary programs that students can opt into that sort of explore these great books and these great questions. Because a lot of times what you'll find, so I don't want to sound too negative, but a lot of times I've worked at a handful of universities and trying to make any sort of serious changes in a positive direction are very difficult, mm -hmm. especially if you're trying to change requirements. Right. But if you can sort of establish these programs where people can opt in, what we see is, is that they're succeeding. So Clemson has an excellent program where yep. this is flourishing. Emory University, where I worked briefly, also has a flourishing one. We're trying to get one started at Ashland. So. Great. Yeah. Well, that's, that's good to hear because yeah. there are ways Apparently, what I'm seeing and hearing from you and others, yeah. you can navigate universities. We can. And find absolutely. those oases, as it were. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, you love the great books. I love it. I'm, I'm getting that impression sure. distinctly. If you would recommend one text. To, just one? Well, it's hard, right? It's <laughs> That's hard, fair. but you've got to make a choice. But just to get started, right, for a young adult, okay. right, somebody who's looking at college or maybe in the middle of their college experience, sure. what one text. And then I'm going to ask you for another, if it is different, Okay. for, let's say, the generation beyond, right? Okay, sure. Mine and others, right? What, what so, uh, it's a book that I always teach uh, when I teach introductory political theory courses, introductory government courses. Um, it's a book that speaks especially to young people, The Education of Cyrus by Xenophon, of course. Okay. Um, it is, it's a book with a clear hero. It has a story. Uh, it's been called the first novel. And mm -hmm. so it's, it's, it's a work of history in a certain sense. It's also a work of literature in another sense. And it traces the development of uh, a young boy, Cyrus, from his youth to him becoming emperor of the, the Persian Empire. So he becomes Cyrus the Great. So it's the sort of, it's an overarching story about the development of this young man. And it's, you know, it, it, it focuses on how important his virtues are his, um, his self-control, you know, his justice, his mercy, these kinds of things. And so in a way, he's, he's exhibiting great leadership skills. Mm. Now, it's not completely without faults, and I think that he does make some mistakes along the way, and, and Xenophon, by choosing this title, The Education of Cyrus, is trying to insist upon how important education is for a, a life well lived, so, yeah. Well, Dr. C Dr. McBrayer, thank you thank for you. this time. Thank you for joining us here yeah. at the symposium in 2020. And uh, it's great to have you with us. It's been a pleasure, thank you, sir.